My name's Megan. I'm 26. I currently live in San Diego, but I will be living in Vegas in about a month. Um, so starting to travel around a little bit, kind of chase the bodybuilding scene a little bit more. Um, I'm an online fitness coach, so I am CEO of a online fitness company uh, called Monarch. Me and my partner, Caroline, run that together. We're a team of seven, and currently we are, oh, I think, a little bit over 100 clients. So um, we've been doing that for the past couple of years. I got into personal training about five years ago. I started off in person when I was living in L.A., and um, I actually started lifting, I think it's about 10 years ago now. I was in high school when I made my way into the gym. But when it comes to actually lifting well and knowing what I am doing, I would say that's like the past two years. And um, five years ago was when I really decided I was going to take things very seriously. And um, uh, or five or six years ago, I would say before I became a, an in-person trainer, um, is when I was like, no, I'm going to like really learn and take stuff seriously. So I feel like through any lifting journey, um, every single year, you feel like the year before that you weren't even doing as well, or you didn't even know as much as you know now. Um, I think that's kind of the trend for my, my journey. Or it's a, it's a trend for me every single year I look back and I go, man, I wasn't even like training well, not like compared to where I'm at now. So um, yeah, you could, you could put different timestamps on all of it, but I would I say I stepped in the gym 10 years ago, but I've been doing quite well consistently with it for probably like the past five. <laughs> yeah. I think that's very true. You know, we all kind of, you know, we start at a certain point and, and some people, they start out with what they see around them. Some people start out with, you know, the little bit of advice they might get from a, you know, a brother, a sister, a cousin, you know, whatever, some people might, you know, go in there and hire a trainer straight off the bat, which, you know, certainly would probably recommend for most people. <laughs> um, you know, you learn a lot over, like you said, each year you kind of learn, oh, wow, if I would have done it like this for the past year, I would have been, you know, in this spot, maybe a little bit better than where I am. But, you know, each year you do learn, you do grow. And I think you, you gain a little bit of like a, an appreciation from where you started versus where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Every, every single year, not only in like what I'm doing for myself, but how I coach my clients as well. I feel like I just made a, a reel on this the other day. I feel like the best coaches out there, the best athletes out there are the ones that believe that they know nothing ever. And they are always learning like constantly every single day. You're just trying to gather more knowledge, whether it's from a book or a YouTube series or a podcast you listen to or whatever, like you're just, your door for learning is always open and I think that's really what's began to kind of like set me apart when it comes to being in the coaching business, the online business for so long. I think a lot of people kind of putter out after a year or two. And like, I've been, now that I've been in it for about five in total, and I see that as like the whole really rest of my career is, is coaching. I, I see that like what really sets us apart as a team is the fact that we're just like voracious learners. Yeah. And I think that's very important to, to consider is like every, everything we know is constantly changing, especially with, you know, in concern with the human body and, and you know, the, the nutrition side of things is, is changing so quickly, so rapidly and, and becoming more personalized from a diet perspective, from a workout perspective, we're learning that if, you know, if you, you have these certain things within your body, then you should eat this or you should train like this more or, you know, whatever it is, there's so much research going into things. There's so much kind of, you know, excitement really in the world of fitness and, um, you know, the way that we've been doing it for, you know, decades is really starting to become more personalized. It's really changing to fit each individual person. Yeah. I think that's something that, you know, a couple of years ago when your first like you know, online influencers started to pop up and people just started doing the online coaching thing when it was still really new, there wasn't as much of a focus on just delivering, you know, high value custom programs to your clients and like helping them specifically understand their body and their goals. It was a lot more about kind of like simply just getting people into the gym, giving them macros, helping them work out. And now that this whole industry 
has become what it's become, which I think is absolutely incredible just to see the evolution of it, of it over the past couple of years. The best coaches out there, um, my coaches included, are the ones that are, you know, really, really hands on. They're the people who are, you know, like we said, you know, constantly learning, but they're constantly learning about you too, as a client. Like there's just like all throughout my prep, we made the smallest little adjustments to my programming, to my nutrition. There was just no one, I'm especially through prep. You can't have a cookie cutter prep. You really can't if you're gonna be successful. And like obviously I did pretty well in my in my first show. So I think it just goes to show like that evolution, it's heading in the right direction when people are really starting to understand that like it is so specific these days. And if you if you do have competitor dreams, like you do need to be with a coach that's going to understand that like every single every single day of your last couple of weeks of prep needs to be so hands-on, so tuned in to get you to where you need to be on that stage. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting. You mentioned kind of how it takes time to learn your client as well, because you know, getting to talk to several different coaches here on the podcast, they, they will say, you know, it takes three, six, 12 months to really nail down what's going on with a person, you know, how they respond to all these different variables that get thrown at you when you start training certain ways and start eating certain foods. And, you know, maybe we need to swap out this food or something else because it, you know, causes inflammation or whatever. And uh, this training maybe isn't as uh, this certain exercise doesn't target this muscle for you as well. Like it's really crazy because then, you know, you, you think you learn that about a person and then their body changes, you know, you know, with, with age or with whatever happens in life, your, your own body can change. And then it's like a, a constant stage of trying to learn what is best for a person. And I think that's exciting and also kind of scary, I guess, as a coach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've been with my coaches now for just over a year. I think it's like 14 months or something. And it, it really took us that long to nail down like how my body responds to everything. And we had to go through a peak week to see what we needed to do to be able to get my body to peak. Um, but I, you know, like I, I have people now inquiring with me, even though I'm not a prep coach yet asking me like, do you prep people? Can you prep me if I wanted to compete in the, um, October summer shredding, because they have that coming up. I think they're doing, um, two, two every year now. Um, could I do it? And it's like, no, you can't <laughs> like, I, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't prep you in three months. No coach would really want to be prepping you in three or four months if they don't know your body yet. Like if you have dreams of competing, of going through a prep, you need to be thinking about a year from now or two years from now, depending on your starting point to, you know, a give your coach the time to learn you, but also for you to like figure out, can you even be consistent with this stuff? Like, is this something that you're going to be able to, to keep up with? Because I was, before we even headed into prep, I was probably consistent with my macros and my training for like, I think it was probably like six to eight months with my coaches with no goal to prep. It was just every single day. That's already what I did. I was already checking all of those boxes. So when we decided to do the prep, it was like, they didn't have a single doubt in their mind that I'd be able to nail my protocols perfectly every day. I was already doing that. If you can't do that outside of prep, then you probably need a lead in of, you know, one to two years to even get yourself to that point of consistency and to get an understanding of your body for your coaches to get an understanding of your body for you to be able to approach that mountain. Cause it is, it's a lot. <laughs> All right, guys, we're going to take a quick break here just for a second. Let me tell you about smoking gun coffee. They're a veteran owned coffee company that strives to produce a quality coffee at an affordable price. They only buy coffee from small coffee farmers around the world with a cup score of at least 85. Each batch is roasted to order for maximum freshness. They also donate a large portion of their proceeds to organizations that help local communities, veterans, first responders, or you can donate to the foundation of your choice at the checkout by going to www.smokinguncoffee.com. That's S-M-O-K-I-N, gun coffee. Yeah, it is. It's crazy how much does go into it. And really, I, th I say it all the time, but I think this this sport of bodybuilding, it, it's so meticulous. You know, you have to get 
almost everything right all the time. It feels like there's a lot of, you know, a lot of expectation for yourself to just be, just to be as perfect, you know, certainly we can't be perfect, but as perfect as we can for very long stretches of time, you know, how do you deal with that as a, as a athlete and as a coach, uh, how do you deal with that from both perspectives? I think it, it takes, and I'm realizing this now uh, after going through it, uh, I think it takes a a very like special mindset or particular type of person to be able to aim for perfection on a day-to-day basis, but also like not internalize the failure that sometimes comes along with being perfect. Like I had, I think in, in four months, I had two days of my entire prep where like things weren't hit. And one day was because I had gotten COVID and that was my worst day of COVID. I couldn't really do much at all. So I didn't work out that day and I like, didn't quite get my macros that day. Um, I think, and then there was another day that I was like really sick at the beginning of my prep that it was just like hard to nail it. So the difference of that from someone who is internalizing it versus not internalizing it, you know, when you have those days with the goal of perfection, where you fall short, when you look at that and you go, I suck, I can't do this anymore. Like I fucked up. Like if you're like in that headspace, when you're aiming for perfection, you're going to make it harder to keep going after you've had that moment where you didn't reach perfection. Cause I mean, it's just so hard to, for, you know, 90, 120 days straight, be so exact and perfect on everything. So it's inevitable that some things are going to be missed here and there, but if you're internalizing it, you're not going to be able to keep doing this again and again and again. The top athletes, though they are more perfect than anybody else, the people who are on the Olympia stage, you know, a lot of them, I think have that mindset where it's just like, okay, next day, let's go next day, next opportunity. You just keep going. And that outlook is what builds that consistency and that discipline and that kind of mindset that is unwavering when it comes to the little failures that you're going to experience along the way. And I feel like I'm, I'm pretty good with that. Um, my, uh, partner in business, Caroline, she's also, um, going to probably be heading into a prep here pretty soon. And she is the same way, you know, like I can, I've started to really see that in people in that, you're going to have your failures, but the people who don't internalize their failures go farther and go faster and get back up much quicker than those who are aiming for the same goal, but beat themselves up about it when they do experience those failures. So yeah, perfection is a lot of pressure. And as bodybuilders, we quite literally choose to put that pressure on ourselves, but it's, it's a test of your character. It teaches you so much. It's a, an amazing opportunity to be able to get to go through it. Like it's a genuine privilege to be able to try, to try for something like this, to strive for something like this. I mean, there's so many people out there who don't even have access to like food and clean water. And yet like you're choosing to go through a prep where by the end of it, you are very much restricting, like pretty hardcore. Um, so I think when you take that outlook on things and like I said, you don't internalize the failures and you realize this is a choice, this is a privilege. This is a really awesome thing I get to do. It really helps you kind of look at each day that you're aiming for perfection as like just another battle that you're going to win. That's just going to make you better. Yeah. It almost seems like it would be kind of, a, you know, a, an idea of like, if I'm taking this seriously, then I have to beat myself up over it. You know, I feel like that's a big misconception. Yeah. Whereas, like you said, it, it, it's just a matter of like having the outlook of next thing, like what's next, taking it seriously, of course, but, but having that mindset of like, that was an opportunity, but there's also an opportunity right in front of me. And if I don't focus on that opportunity, you know, the same thing's going to happen. So it feels like it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of, of mental training it's a lot of you know like you said developing throughout and and taking that time like you said one to two years maybe even to develop consistent consistency to develop you know the right mindset to even go into really thinking about when am I going to compete yeah my the mindset is it's the hardest part of it all I think you get to a point where you get really used to being tired. You get to a point where you get used to the food you're eating and saying no. Like there's so many things that you adapt to so quickly 
on prep that the hardest part of it really is the mindset and something that I have been saying to people recently when talking about it is that you also really need to kind of figure out before you go into a prep, if you can just simply control yourself enough to be a nice person when you're in those states of mind where you are very hungry, very tired, very irritable, and somebody's going to want something from you. Like I'm in a relationship and my boyfriend, I, he, he went through it with me. Like you, if you have a significant other, as you go through prep, they're going through it with you, whether they're doing what you're doing or not. Like you don't get to eat out with them and go on dates to go get a burger and things like that. Like if you go watch a movie, like you can't sit there and share a popcorn. Like there's a lot of stuff they're experiencing with you. And if you're going to be cranky and snappy and tired all the time, and you take that out on them, it's going to be so much harder for them to give you the support that you need in those moments. So if you don't have a mindset where you can control your emotions and you can understand that like when you're hungry, you might be snappy, but you need to just like chill and be patient and hold that back instead of taking it out on them. Then again, like another kind of like red flag there that like, you're not quite ready to start prep if you don't have a good control of your emotions. And if you're not comfortable with your own emotions, because another thing that you experience emotionally through prep is that when you have a bad day, you can't just stop at McDonald's, get a burger, go home, watch a movie, chill out. Like nine times out of 10 on prep, you still have things to do. You still need to nail your macros. You still need to get to the gym. You still have your cardio to get in your steps or whatever. Like there's no comfort in prep and there's definitely no comfort from food in prep. And so when you have those bad days, and you want something to lean on, you want to be able to just like let go of your, all your responsibilities and chill like you would in your normal life. You have to get really comfortable with sitting with those emotions and not having a distraction, not having something to soothe them. You just got to sit with them, deal with them, stomach them, work through them and let them teach you something about yourself. Like literally let them build your character to be a better, more patient person, a more understanding person. And like, that's, that's really what I've embraced so much through prep was like the emotional development you get from being in those states where it's like, it's 8 PM. I still need to get my cardio in. My macros are all done. I'm hungry. I'm tired. And all I want to do is just like scream, but you know, and like, and I get home and my boyfriend's eating the chicken that I cooked for myself that day. Like that was a rough day for me. And I had, you know, I had a moment where I just like burst into tears because I was like, crap, like all those things I just listed, I was in that state and I was looking forward to this chicken and it was gone because he thought it was leftovers. But instead of being so angry when I think a lot of people would say like, oh, rightfully so, like I'd be pissed too, right? I like released my emotions. I cried. And I told him, I was like, I'm just like, I was just a surprise. You know, I'm just tired. I'm crying because I'm tired. I'm not crying because I'm mad at you. I understand. I love you. It's not your fault. I have more chicken. I'll cook more chicken. Like all is good. If you can't be that person on prep and just let things go, do some emotional development while you have food in you before you go to a point where you are starting to take away all of your food. (laughs) Yeah, no, I've never thought about it like that. It is almost like a time where you, you can, you can choose to, if you want to, to really feel what it is to have certain emotions, because I think, like you mentioned, we do typically, you know, we drown them in food or alcohol or other kind of drugs or, you know, TV or sleep, like all these, these different distractions. And it feels like prep is that time to where if you use it right, it can actually, you know, can be a really cool way to identify and um you know appreciate what's going on you know, appreciate the emotions and learn how to work through them in a healthy way yeah absolutely that's that's um probably my my biggest takeaway from prep so far is exactly that like it's a big big emotional builder <laughs> yeah certainly it seems like it would be um so going back in time a little bit you know bodybuilding it, it it's not the biggest, most popular sport out there, obviously, you know, it's not the mainstream thing. When did, when did it become a part of, you know, your consciousness? When did it get on your radar? I always say 
that like the first person that really, really got me into fitness was, um, interestingly enough, Heidi Summers. And, um, I got to meet her for the first time this weekend, almost burst into tears several times. because I was so excited. She's always been such an inspiration for me. Um, but I remember when she was competing and, um, I think it was like 2016 that I had her as like my phone background. And that was to me, like, that was what I wanted to achieve because I was never good at other sports. Like I played softball for like five years as a kid. Like I started like very little league. And my last year was like my freshman year of high school because I was really bad at it. I was just not, I wasn't big. I wasn't really strong. I, the only thing I was was fast. And so then I tried track and then I had like problems with my arches and my feet falling for track, like uh, really painful stuff going on. So I couldn't compete in that track season. And I was great at school. I was uh, like valedictorian in high school. So I was like the brainy kid and I loved being good at something, but I like, you know, to a point, like you can be so smart, you can be so good at school, whatever, but there's so much value in doing things that are like artistic or physical. And I just had no skill set there at all whatsoever. So my junior year of, um, yeah, my junior year of high school, I kind of, I think I downloaded um, Instagram and it was just a photo editing app then. Like no one had Instagram in 2012. Like it was crazy. Um, but I downloaded that and then I started, I somehow started to stumble upon these people who were posting about bodybuilding and they were posting about fitness and I was downloading different apps and doing workouts in my room. And like I said, eventually came across Heidi Summers and her competition. And I thought, oh man, like this is something I can be good at, good at because it was such a personal sport. Like I didn't have a team that I was going to let down because I sucked at my, you know, role. I didn't have, um, like at that, at that point fitness for fitness, I didn't have a coach who, you know, wasn't going to put me in the game. Cause I experienced that so many times through softball. So to me, bodybuilding was like, okay, like I can lift weight. I'm really diligent. Like I can do these things on my own. I can learn how to eat. I can learn how to do all these things by myself. And, um, cause I had a lot of like faith in myself. I was like, yeah, I can do this. But then going to college, I gained a lot of weight and my focus very quickly went to a bunch of other things. And so throughout college, I was still going to the gym, but I stopped kind of believing in myself in the sense that like any kind of real competition dreams were possible for me. I thought it was just like outlandish. I thought also after reading a lot of like, you know, people who have the horror stories of bodybuilding where their coaches took them to like, you know, 700 calorie intakes and, um, they were, you know, really hormonally damaged after that. Um, I just kept telling myself all of these things like, you know, um, oh, I shouldn't compete. It'll be bad for me. I shouldn't compete. I can't afford it, which I mean, that would make sense, but I shouldn't, you know, here are all the reasons I shouldn't compete and I shouldn't be a bodybuilder. I'll do fitness in another way. And that, you know, eventually led me to coaching and all these things. And so in order to protect my ego, really, I didn't jump into competition for so long because I just didn't think I was going to be good at it. It was the same thing with softball. I hated sucking at softball. I didn't want to suck at something else that I started off loving. So I was just going to keep fitness as fitness and not make it bodybuilding. And yet I was following all these competitors. And I remember um, a couple of years back, I saw Des B get ready to go into a prep, another influencer online. And I think that was like 2018. And I was like, man, I really, really want to do that. And I said, it. I was like, I'm going to do it someday. That At that point, I think I still had my Instagram. I've had many Instagrams. I've like created accounts, built them to 10K, deleted them. It's been a whole cycle. But um, I saw that and I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to compete someday. And, and again, for like three or four more years, I was like, no, 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 I'm not going to do it. And then when I met my coaches, um, they had some bodybuilders on their roster and they had a lot of lifestyle clients. And I was like, no, I'm just going to like, I'm going to be a lifestyle client. Like I'm not going to compete. I just need to have, I've worked with other coaches and I just wanted to go into the coaching. I wanted to have a coach again, just to like, you know, 
be consistent, be adherent to a plan. It feels good for me to, to have a plan. And I just started believing in myself. I just started kind of thinking more and more like, man, I could do this. I could do this. I'm actually really healthy right now. Like my intake is really high. My hormones are in a really great place. I'm feeling really strong. My, my injuries that I had had started to resolve themselves, or I put a lot of effort into fixing them. And my coaches helped me so much with that. And I just got to a point where I was like, I could, I really could do this. Like I, I could hit every protocol. My body feels great. We're not going to have to like bring my intake down super low to a point where I'm going to have hormonal issues in this entire prep. I've never had an issue. And I, when I finally saw that and it kind of popped up in front of me as like, you could be a bodybuilder and you could actually really be really freaking good at it, not just try it, but be successful at it be, and in part largely. Cause I do have like a pretty good genetic makeup for it. Um, I just was kind of like, damn, I, I need to do this for me. Like uh, an act of self-love really is like what this is, is allowing myself to compete and just chase a dream I've held off so long on. And obviously like it played out quite well for me, but that's really like my whole background with bodybuilding was just this like push and pull of like, when will I do it? Will I do it? Am I going to let myself do it? And then finally just diving all in really over the past year and, and getting to this point where we want. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Congratulations, by the way. Well, thank you. <laughs> so this podcast is sponsored by Smoking Gun Coffee, a veteran-owned coffee company that strives to give back to those in need. Don't forget to use code TWR10 for a 10% discount at checkout. A show like Summer Shredding, especially, you know, since you have that you know, that background in social media and, you know, you're following people who are a part of bodybuilding and a part of kind of this event, you know, what did that feel like when you decided, Hey, this is the show I'm going to do. Was there any, you know, was there any level of like, I, I want to make sure I step up there and I'm representing myself the best that I can, because I'll kind of look up to some of these people. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I, my coach, uh, Chad Morgan, he, used to live in Houston. He actually has a lot of connections out there and has a lot of friends out there. And so he loves the bodybuilding space and loves to bring his first time competitors through summer shredding because the attitude around that show is very different compared to NPC. It's very welcoming, very encouraging. Like there's just a lot of really good vibes in summer shredding. So people I've heard plenty of people say, Oh, it's not a real bodybuilding show. Oh, it's easy. Like, okay, sure. Like, you know, so what if it is, I'm still going to, you know, approach it. Like I'm get, I'm trying to win. I'm going to try to be the absolute best, whether you think it's an easy show or not, but he loves that show for the community. It builds. I experienced that while I was there. And so having that also be tied to Alpha Lee and knowing of course, because Christian and Heidi are Christian and Heidi, that Heidi was also going to be there being someone who I've always looked up to my expectation for myself growing into that show was of course I want to win and I'm going to do like my damnedest to do so. But if not, I just want to really get noticed. I want to be seen by people who I've been watching for so long and I want to thank them for everything that they've done. I want to be be able to interact with them but I also just want to get into a crowd and network and be around people who are associated with brands that I have always wanted to be associated with. So for me, it was like, this is a great opportunity to not only get into a world, the world of bodybuilding, but also kind of step into the influencer world and social media world a little bit more and lean into it a little bit more um, and see what can kind of come to fruition there. Because I've always also had like influencer dreams. I've always wanted to kind of be affiliated with a big brand and I love content creation. Like I, I don't know. There's some people love it. Some people hate it. I think it is an incredibly creative job. Like I said, I was great at school. I didn't have any art skills. I didn't have any sports skills. Well, my art skills now come to, or my creative skills come out in content creation and my sports skills come out in bodybuilding. Like I've, I've found my place. So that's really what this show 
did for me. It just mixed it all together. It put it all in one place. And it was like, sure, there was a lot of pressure um, that I like put on myself, but um, my coach has competed in uh, summer shredding as well. He took second to Alex Toplin when he competed. And it was just kind of this really cool full circle moment where um, I was in the overall against one of Alex Toplin's clients. And he had so many clients there. They were absolutely incredible. Um, and they have a great relationship, like a, a not a rivalry, but like a, a fun French a competitive friendship. And so I got to bring home this win for my coach and um, kind of see their interactions play out, Alex and Chad. And it was really, really cool. Um, and I feel like the pressure wasn't pressure of like, you have to win, you have to be successful. It was just, you have to make the most out of this opportunity, win or lose, talk to people, create a community, put your best out there, get feedback, learn about yourself, learn about your body, obviously through your first peak. And that, that was really what this show was for me. And I think that for anybody who has interest in competing, summer shredding is absolutely an invaluable experience. Like it doesn't want matter what anybody else says or what they think about it. If you have interest in doing it, whether it's in any division or whether it's the transformation division, like that is such a freaking cool division. Like no other bodybuilding, um, federation is like anything has anything like the transformation division. Literally any single human being can decide to compete at summer shredding. And that is the coolest thing about that show. So when I look at it, I'm like, it, I just think it is, it's an honor, whether it's a social media show or not, it's an honor to participate in it. And I was only excited about the entire thing. Like I never had a reason to not be absolutely stoked, whether, even if I like, I told myself, even if I lose, even if I don't do well at this show, what a really cool opportunity to network and meet all of these amazingly inspirational people. I don't care if Alf Land was absolutely freaking packed. It was so freaking cool just to be there as someone who's been in this industry for such a long time. Like I've seen all, I've seen all the discussions all over um, all, all social media, like so many people, you can't even work out there. And I was like, it was so cool. It was just so freaking cool to me. I don't know if you've been to um, Gold's Gym Venice, but it's a very like, I think it is a different feeling, but it's similar in the sense that like you walk in and there is, there's an energy there. There's something about these locations where um, if you are part of that community and you don't walk in with like a chip on your shoulder or something, because I think a lot of people are like, oh, it's an influencer gym. I love influencers. I'm part of that community. And I think that, you know, they're, what they do is also really, really cool. It's a fascinating occupation to have in this like digital age. If you walk in there and you just look at it for what it is, a beautiful, well-equipped gym where you have different, like literal different training environments. And you have gym one where there's the AC, gym two where you're working out in like the heat and humidity of Houston, Um, gym three, where it's just that like tiny little gym with like older equipment. And like, I'd say kind of like classic bodybuilding posing rooms and stuff. Like you get to choose your environment within alpha land in three different gym experiences. Like if you just look at that for what it is, it's really cool. And if you are into fitness and training and you just kind of walk in there getting to like thinking about celebrating what fitness really is and the social aspect of fitness, it's amazing because it really brings a community from literally all over the world to one spot, just as the Mecca does in, in Venice Beach. Like Alpha Land is its own type of Mecca for the, the fitness influencer. And it's just, I think it's just so freaking cool. Yeah. It's awesome. I think it's special in its, in its own unique way because it is like, you know, there are certain gyms that are like big for powerlifters, big for bodybuilders, big for this niche. But I feel like Outland's the it kind of encompasses fitness in general. You know, the whole broad yeah. spectrum, and people can kind of come and uh, you know work out together and you know really feel that energy. But um, kind of talking about this show, you know, you, whenever you initially stepped on stage, you know, take us through some of the emotions, some of the thoughts going through your head, and then 
you know, a little bit later on, whenever your name gets called, tell us a little bit about that as well. For me, the whole thing, I I was crying all the way leading up to it, up to the show um, for like a couple of weeks. And even when I just like decided to compete, because I was just so proud of myself, I was so proud of my team. So um, everything was very emotional. Everything meant a lot to me. Um, Everything was a big deal. And I was so okay with that. The first time I stepped on stage, the first round, um, I was in class B. I was, I mean, obviously I was so anxious, so nervous the whole day because I'd never done it before. So I was like, you know, is my posing, am I going to remember my posing routine? Like, am I going to be able to perform? And you get up, you do your posing routine, then you go off to the sideline and you have to just stand there and hold your pose. And I, um, I've been practicing posing just relentlessly for like eight or nine months. And so I think what helped me win the show really was my posing and presentation, but trying that, to hold that pose for that long, um, when you haven't really held it for like two, three, four minutes at a time, um, it's hard. It's really tough. And like my whole body just like started to shake and then you don't really want to sit there and like shake on stage. It's not really a good idea. Um, but I, the nervousness alongside with recognizing that I was shaking was making me shake more and then I wasn't breathing. And so I was really just at that point conscious, trying to like slow my breathing down. They lined us all up for first call outs and had us do the kind of like walking back and forth thing. And then I got moved to center and I was like, that was the moment where I knew I did a good job already when I got moved to center and I held center in first call outs. And I was like, like all that anticipation, all that wonder, all that worry, like, am I going to be in the top? Do I, am I coming across as good as I feel or am I going to get like my ass whooped (laughs) and and some clarification on the fact that there's some work to do. Um, But getting moved to center in that first round, I was like, okay, we got this. Like I did well, I look good. I held it together. And immediately when I got off stage that first time, all the shakes and the nervousness just left. And I was excited to get back on stage and do better because when I was on stage, as soon as I got off, my coaches were right there and they were ready to like, give me point, congratulate me, but give me pointers. And he was saying, you know, like, I don't think anybody else could really tell that you were shaking. Um, I was watching you like a hawk. So obviously like I started to see you kind of like try to catch your breath and everything. But now that you're a little bit less nervous, it's going to be easier for you to hold your pose. Your breathing is going to be better. Do not take your eyes off the judges, period. Like listen to them and every call that they say, and don't stop looking at them no matter what. Don't look around. Don't look at anybody else. Look at the judges. Eye contact the entire time. Smile, do your facials. Like you got this. You already got center. You're going to get first in your class. Like just hold it down. And, um, after that, like pep talk from my team and like real recognizing what I needed to work on, I was excited to get back on stage. And when you're standing there, you have the lights that are kind of blinding you. Like I couldn't really see the judges' faces. I could see all of my friends sitting up there because the lights, you know, a little bit farther past the lights is easier to see them, but you can't see the judges' faces. They all just look like blobs, which kind of helps because you aren't really looking at anybody in the eye. You're just looking at these blobs and you're like, okay, cool. Like they're just, everybody's just a blob. Second time I got on stage, the confidence was there 110%. And it just was like, it it felt like a a performance that I was like kind of born to do that I had been practicing for, for so long. And so that's when the sass came back. I was holding my poses. I was breathing just fine. There wasn't any shaking. I was listening to all of their cues. I was keeping my eyes on them. And Throughout that second round, I started to really think, you got this, like you nailed this. And the girl next to me, um, Kimberly, who is one of Alex Toplin's clients, looked incredible. Like she looked amazing. And if anything, I was like, it's either me or her. Um, I think the girl who was third in our class is actually, she actually competes in wellness, which is incredible. She had come out of a wellness season and decided like, hey, why not? Let's do this. But I, I knew I had had good competition. It wasn't like an easy win by any sense. And I know that Kimberly very soon someday will have her pro card too. It's like she killed it. So winning my class was like, wow, like the one girl that I'd really been focusing on that I knew was competition. Um, I, I like beat her and I was like, damn, okay. Like, so I really do have this, a shot at taking the overall after that experience. And, um, 
Kimberly is someone I actually made really good friends friends with online. So like it was, it's like always an honor to share the stage with someone who you really enjoy, who's like becoming your friend. And so that was really cool. And um, after that, when we got called out for the overalls, even more like that, that third round of getting out on stage for the overall comparisons, um, I, that's that moment where I felt like this is what I meant to do. Like, I feel at home. I feel, I just felt like I was on cloud nine. I was just, and part of it is when you're doing well, obviously it's a lot easier to be happier on stage than when like maybe you aren't doing as well, but I was going through that and I thought, I can't wait to step on stage again. Like, I can't wait to do the work all next year to do it again and again and again. And, um, there were no shakes. There were no like scary breathing. Like I was just excited. And again, I was next to a girl. Um, her name's Erin stunning. She has done pageants before. So her stage presence was absolutely incredible. And I knew again, like in the overall, she was the one that I was really probably going to be working pretty hard to be. And another person I had made really good friends with online. So again, it was like an honor to be standing next to her. Cause I was like, she's freaking killing it. And like, so am I. And we, it's like, you're kind of doing it together when you're with someone that you know, and you like, and you stop thinking about the fact that it's a competition. You just kind of start vibing and flowing through it because you're never really looking at them, but you're just there with them experiencing it. So that was my, my, my whole stage experience. It was, it was really fun. And I know that I've been told that NPC is very different and I have my first NPC show. I'm two and a half weeks out. So I hopped right back into prep, but, um, my goal in going through NPC is still going to be to make as many friends as possible to be the nicest freaking person out there on stage and backstage and just continue to kind of bring that mentality to the industry where like, we're all actually just on the same team. Um, so yeah, that's, that was kind of the journey (laughs) all three times I went on the stage, different emotions, but, um, I've never had such a feeling of being right where I needed to be, like being right where I belonged, especially in all my years of softball, never once felt as good as I did on the field or on that stage as I did on the field or vice versa, like never felt good on the field. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, that, that's such a cool kind of you know, roller coaster of emotion, you know, getting the the nervousness and then becoming confident. And I think that's kind of uh in such a short span of time, it's 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 kind of how everybody's fitness journey goes too in a, in a yeah. lot of ways. You know, you walk into the gym the first time, the first week, the first month, whatever, it's like you're super nervous. You know, are people looking at me, am I doing this exercise right? You know, all that stuff. And then you gain a little bit more confidence as you go. And it's kind of cool how, how your show kind of was that, was that, you know, snapshot of uh, almost a fitness journey. And it was just real quick right there on that, on that show day. Yeah, I I completely agree with you. I think something I say all the time is fitness is a wonderful metaphor for life. It is in every way. And, um, that like experience over probably a span of maybe like 30, 45 minutes is absolutely how so many people enter the fitness space with that nervousness until they get to a point where they're like, no, I can do this. Like I'm doing really well with this. They start seeing their results. They start feeling really good. They start loving the gym instead of dreading the gym. Um, it was, yeah, literally exactly that. So you kind of mentioned it, you touched on it a little bit, but you know, what's in the future for you? You said you kind of pop right, right back into prep, but, uh, you know, more specifically, what, what do you see yourself doing, um, you know, in the next short little future? Yeah. Um, I have a show in Los Angeles in two and a half weeks and that's my first NPC show. So going to do our absolute best there. Um, our plan is to come in just a little bit leaner, a little bit tighter in the legs, uh, for NPC and, um, Likely after that show, my growing season will be about a year or two. Um, I need to add a lot more density in my legs. Uh, right now, my arms and my, my upper body are at a pretty good place for what the bikini division is. I think that even there, like we could probably afford maybe a little bit more density. So just like overall growth in general um, before we hop back into competition again. But I am 
very okay with taking long off seasons. I, I love to eat out with my boyfriend. I love to go, you know, do things and live life. And on prep, I'm very, very diligent. And so we don't get to do a lot of those things. So after my next NPC show, most likely going to be, um, uh, a good, long, enjoyable off season. Um, we don't necessarily know exactly how I'll do with that NPC show. It could go very well and I could actually do quite well there, get first call outs. I could, um, uh, my coaches have said, Hey, you know, like we might be in a place depending on how the next three weeks go where we could win my class, which would be cool. You never know who's going to show up though. Like you, you're, you're judged on a criteria for, for bodybuilding, but you're also judged against who else is there. So like if everybody on stage shows up and they all meet the criteria quite well, it's who meets the criteria, the absolute best. It's not just, Oh, like you do meet the criteria. You've checked the box. Like you can go to nationals. Like there has to be a ranking always. So I could show up and do very, very well. And I could show up and not do well at all because everybody else who chose to show up there um, absolutely crushed it. And I'm okay with that either way, because the goal really this season, my first season, was just to get feedback and just to get in front of the judges and kind of get to know them. Um, If I do really well at that NPC show, there is USA's two weeks later in Vegas, which is really close to us. And my coaches and I have talked about it and though we are not at all trying to make a pro card run in my first season that's kind of outlandish and I'm definitely not in the place with my physique quite yet that I would consider that to make any sense at all um there is again a a value of getting in front of those judges especially in NPC um and being seen being part of the community again making friends having practice on stage Uh, it's like putting reps in, you know? So, um, we've talked about it. And if I do really well at the LA show, we have the intention of going to USA's just to experience it. I've already seen a lot of girls who are going to the USA's who are making pro card runs. So I don't have any expectations of that show except to just enjoy every second of it and cheer those ladies on because I really, I mean, man, there's some incredible physiques out there that I know are going to be at USA's and I'm very excited to kind of start to enter the ring with them and learn from them as I see that if I do make it to the USA stage this year. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, very, very exciting, you know, coming into your first show, getting out really, uh, a really cool experience. A, like you said, getting to meet a lot of people who you know, you've looked up to, you followed and then coming in with a win. It's just such a cool way to kind of start off the, the journey really. And, you know, best of luck to you in the future. It's really cool getting to talk to you and, and, uh, like I said, best of luck and, and definitely we'll have to have you back on here whenever, you know, you hit that first NPC show and, you know, talk about how that experience was compared to, you know, a show like Summer Shredding. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy to to chat about it all and hopefully over the years, even come back and eventually talk about a pro card win. <laughs> yes, definitely. Definitely. That would be awesome. But uh, if people want to follow you on social media, where can they do that? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram, uh, under Meg Hayes, M E A G H A Y E S. And then my TikTok is similar. It's just Megan Hayes. So it's M E A G A N N H A Y E S. There's an N extra N in there for my middle name. So yeah, TikTok, Instagram, they're all linked to each other. There's all those buttons. You can kind of find me on either one. There's a YouTube channel somewhere in there. I'm all over. (laughs) Well, it sounds good. I'll have to put that down in the description. And once again, I really do appreciate you coming on. It was really cool getting to talk to you, getting to meet you and, uh, you know, getting to hear about your experience. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it.